Welcome to the 81st Annual Cold Spring Harbor Symposium. This year's topic is targeting cancer. My name is Paula Kaburstis. I'm a senior editor at Science Magazine in Washington, D.C. And I have the privilege today of speaking with Dr. Christopher Vatkoch, who is, um, has a lab right here in beautiful Cold Spring Harbor. And um, Chris is interested in transcription as a target for cancer which is a pretty big target. And Chris, I, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about um, the history of, tar of transcription in cancer research and why you feel it's, it's a good target for therapy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what um, many decades of cancer research has taught us is that there are some fundamental hallmarks of cancer biology that I think everyone in the field recognizes. and. What's clear is behind every hallmark feature of a cancer cell is an aberrant transcriptional program, mm -hmm. which is not surprising. All of biology is driven by changes in gene expression. Mm -hmm. Cancer biology is no different. Um, so there's kind of an obviousness to the role of transcription, of course, in, in cancer. What makes it more compelling than that, though, is what the sequencing of cancer genomes has taught us about the, the causes of cancer. Mm -hmm. There are old vintage examples like P53 and MYC. Some yep. of the most heavily mutated gene, uh, genes in cancer are transcription factors. Right. Um, we've known that for ages. There's been recent discoveries that have kind of reinforced, and kind of reminded us of the importance of transcription, specifically the discovery that almost all human cancers have mutations of chromatin regulators. Mm -hmm so-called epigenetic regulators involved in transcription as well. Um, and this is really a, a recent discovery made in the last six years or so. And I think kind of the new wave of evidence behind the role of transcription is the discovery that there are non-coding mutations in cancer genomes that are incredibly common, which are often missed by when you sequence only exomes and protein coding genes. And we're realizing that the binding sites of transcription factors are also heavily mutated in different malignancies. Mm -hmm. and so you put all these kind of older and more recent lines of evidence together and it's really un indisputable, indisputable that transcription is messed up in right. cancer as a driver mechanism. Right. So. Okay, um, so that takes us into your work. Um, five years ago you published a very influential paper um, in which you and a group in Boston sort of independently came, arrived at the same protein as a target for cancer. And that's always very exciting when two groups independently arrive at the same place. And the protein is uh, called BRD, um, BRD4. And I wondered if you could tell us about that and the story of how all that happened. Yeah, so I... Um I think knowing if one has, if one is aware that tra aberrant transcription is a driver of cancer, the obvious kind of uh, usefulness of that information is the idea that cancer cells are going to be vulnerable to perturbations of transcription. Yeah. My whole lab has been built on that hypothesis. Yeah. And we, when I came to Cold Spring Harbor, we set out to go hunting for vulnerabilities in transcription control that cancer cells have that normal cells do not possess. Mm -hmm. And so part of the, the draw of coming to Cold Spring Harbor was to use RNA interference screening. That was pioneered in part by Greg Hannon and Scott Lowe here. And we, we set up a system to go about systematically knocking down every chromatin protein in, in, a, in an aggressive cancer called acute myeloid leukemia. And we were just asking which chromatin protein do leukemia cells need that normal cells do not. Yeah. And this effort led us to this protein called BRD4. Mm -hmm. Targeting BRD4 had a catastrophic phenotype in leukemia and less of a, an effect on normal cells. So it was a discovery based on a genetic screen. It was interesting, there was cool biology undoubtedly behind it. The therapeutic relevance of this was really kind of off in the horizon, yeah. at least in those early days. Yeah. And that's where you know my encounter with Jay Bradner just totally took my scientific career and my life in a totally unexpected direction in the, in, in the best possible sense. Uh -huh. uh, I was made aware, someone pointed out to me that who I had told about our BRD4 observation, actually it was my PhD advisor, knew about our BRD4 observation with our RNAi screen, 
alerted me that Jay Bradner just published a paper in Nature in 2010 describing JQ1, the first small molecule I was aware of that directly targets BRD4, mm -hmm. um, which is just the ultimate serendipity, <laughs> you know, when lightning strikes in the best yeah. possible fashion. Yeah. So you were not aware of this paper beforehand, or you just didn't relate it to what you had discovered? Yeah, I didn't. I, 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 apparently in pharma, there has been effort going on in the background that I was unaware of, of making molecules against this protein. Mm -hmm. And Jay Bradner was really the first to take these molecules behind, from behind the kind of the Iron Curtain of yes. what's happening yeah. in secret in pharma, and really brought these molecules out into the public started distributing them and he's become very famous for this kind of open source yeah. uh, distribution of this molecule yeah. JQ1 and we were one of his first customers and it was a very exciting phone call with Jay where I just totally told him all of our results that we had found yeah. with our RNA ice cream literally the next day he sent us huge quantities of JQ1 and we started treating our leukemia mouse model with this compound thinking that our RNA ice cream predicted that this should be a good target. Yeah. And remarkably it was. Wow. It, I mean, we just went straight for the kind of killer experiment. Uh -huh. And it worked and it really just stunned us yeah. that this could be true. Yeah. And Jay has become a very dear friend and one of my closest collaborators. And working together, we showed that this is actually a, a respectable preclinical mm -hmm. uh, drug-like molecule in mm -hmm. these animal models of leukemia. Right. Um, and the mechanism was kind of the cherry on top, which is that as we dug into the kind of why of how this works, it turns out JQ1 shuts off transcription of CMYK. Mm -hmm. MYK being one of these elusive onco oncogenes that yeah. everyone recognizes as one of the major drivers of human cancer. This drug was working through this kind of classically undruggable target. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this was like science moving at the speed of light and with maximal <laughs> excitement. Yeah. And for me, as a young scientist here, uh, this was just the, the career-changing mm -hmm. moment for us. Mm -hmm. And we published this result in Nature in 2011. Another key detail of all this work is that it's been highly reproducible in other independent laboratories. Mm -hmm. Very similar work was being done in Tony Kuzaridi's lab at, uh, at Cambridge using the JQ1 molecule that GSK had developed mm -hmm. showed the exact same findings and mm -hmm. so straight out of the gate this was a highly reproducible robust finding mm -hmm. and since then pharma has widely replicated these results mm -hmm. which actually is a very it's probably the most important detail in all of this um, and this has led to the rapid movement of these molecules into clinical trials mm -hmm. I think purely because of the replicability of the finding. Yeah. Um, before we talk about the clinical trials, can you tell us a little bit about how this protein works? The BR stands for bromodomain. Yeah. Can you tell us what a bromodomain is and what it does to affect transcription? Yeah, so bromodomains are parts of our protein domains that bind to chromatin, bind to histones, but only when they're modified chemically by lysine side chain acetylation. Okay. So we call them chromatin reader domains. Okay. And kind of the interesting, fascinating thing about this is this is a protein-protein interaction surface. And so JQ1, this really remarkable chemical probe, works not by inhibiting an enzyme, which is how a lot of cancer drugs work, but by just competing, inhibiting how, two, how proteins interact with one another. Um, and so basically JQ1, when its cells are pulsed with this compound, it causes BRD4 uh, to, to be lift off, to, off of chromatin by binding competitively to these bromodomain pockets. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question that you sort of um, talked about during your um, presentation the other day. Um, and there, well, it's two questions that are interrelated. Do you know the mechanism by which um, it has an anti leukemic effect? And also, why would you expect this molecule to selectively affect cancer cells and not normal cells? And those are tough questions, yeah, I these know. Yeah, <laughs> these are the central questions in our laboratory, as yeah. you know. And, and I would say it's, it's coming, we're making progress, but we still do not have a solid answer. Okay. I'd say my background is in total biochemical mechanism of transcription. Yeah. This project, is, for me, is really an anomaly because it was like this fascinating therapeutic response yeah. without a mechanism yeah. that's been the source of the excitement. And now we're working backwards to try to figure out why on earth this actually works. Right. Right. Um, and the short answer is we don't really understand this very well. Um, 
when we target BRD4 with molecules, transcription changes in cancer cells, transcription changes in normal cells. Cancer cells don't like it as much as normal cells do. Mm -hmm. uh, that is probably the most accurate way I could that's describe a, it at this fine. point. That's fine. And of course, there are molecular details that are very fascinating for how this protein works. Mm -hmm. And we've really taken the plunge into trying to decipher every little nugget of how BRD4 executes its right. function in leukemia cells. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the gist of it is that the genes that are changed when you target BRD4 are genes like MYC, are a lot of genes that cancer cells are very dependent upon. And so I, I view it that JQ1 delivers kind of this stress to, the, to a cancer cell by kind of withdrawing a lot of key ingredients yeah. to maintain a transformed cell state. And so non-transformed cells are not as dependent on the genes that JQ1 suppresses. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more mysterious than it is understood yeah. at this point. Um, so the clinical trials, um, have how are, how's the drug doing? I know it, it's not JQ1 itself, it's related drugs, I guess, chemically related drugs. Can you talk about how they're doing? In yeah, I mean, I'm, I have very little involvement in these clinical trials. Uh, we work very much on the basic side of finding targets. Yeah. Um, so many independent pharma groups have made molecules like JQ1. Mm -hmm. It's not JQ1 itself. Uh, Jay Bradner, in his lab, made a drug-like derivative of JQ1 um, and started a, a small biotech company to move these into clinical studies. GSK, many groups have got, moved forward into trials. Um, they started in 2013, and uh, several of these trials are in acute leukemia patients, relapsed refractory acute leukemia that have failed prior chemotherapies. Um, the first trial was led by a company called Oncoethics also using a molecule in the same chemical series as JQ1. They published their leukemia trial a few months ago in Lancet Hematology. And what they've reported uh, is, first of all, Jake, the, the molecule called OTX015 is actually quite well tolerated mm -hmm. at certain doses. And at those to well tolerated doses, there's been some initial evidence of clinical activity with a subset of patients experiencing a complete remission of their disease mm -hmm. um, following single agent therapy with this yeah. OTX015 molecule. And so you can imagine that we've been very enormously excited to see this early lines of evidence. It's also crystal clear though as well that this molecule is not Gleevec. This is not, these responses were not durable. These patients very quickly relapsed. So it's, it's bittersweet in a way. Um, but to be expected, so they develop resistance to the drug. The tumor cells are very smart. They always figure out a way to get around whatever you're doing That's right. to them. I mean, and there's, there's no reason this would be special. But, and there are ways to work out the mechanisms of resistance. Yeah, this yeah. has become um, a, a very area, a very an area of intense interest in the last year. Just uh -huh. um, because I think everyone knew resistance would occur. Why would this be an exception to that? Um, and so we're, the field is really in a stage of trying to figure out what the resistance mechanisms will be. Yeah. Um, several reports have found mechanisms in various mm -hmm. contexts. They're all different. The mechanisms of resistance appear at this stage to be non-genetic. Mm -hmm. So a kind of rewiring of gene expression through what seem to be a multitude of different ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of Very like the, complicated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as one would expect from a target like JQ1, the mechanisms of resistance are equally complicated, if not more so, than the actual mechanism of action. Yeah. Um, and so the uh, you know the challenges are you know are many at this stage. But one is to predict which patients might be most sensitive to these drugs. Mm -hmm. The predictive biomarker yeah. is kind of the holy grail of this field, and of course the right combination therapies that will synergize and. Um, and allow these responses to be more durable. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that we and many, many others are pursuing to, to see what the, whether these molecules can make a real impact in the management of this disease. Yeah. Well, we're running out of time and we didn't even get to talk about your other project, which is this CRISPR-Cas9 screen. Um, but maybe we can do that another time. Sure thing. Thanks very much. Sure. And good luck with your research, Chris. Thank you.